this is really pretty common. You can see what the, uh, the prevalence rates are and, and why this is so important uh, with regard to depression is if you look at bullet item four, uh, after a period of time, uh, almost half of people with sleep apnea are going to develop uh, severe depression. And it's really a testament to how sleep deprivation itself can cause depression. And with obstructive sleep apnea, if you look on this slide, it's where the airway collapses. So up here we have a normal guy you know, breathing in and out at nighttime. Down here with obstructive sleep apnea, uh, the airway collapses and they can't get air in here. And what it does is it forces a reaction, a reflex, where they, they start gasping and they finally get uh, air through the collapsed airway, uh, but it takes a, a lot of effort and they make lots of noise when they're doing that. And the biggest problem with sleep apnea uh, is that, well, two things. One is that these episodes are happening between two and 500 times every night. And, and, and then secondly, uh, is that people don't know it's happening. People can go on for years to have this. And, and the way it interferes with sleep is when they are gasping for air, and you might imagine this, it knocks them out of deep sleep. And so they're getting very little deep sleep. They can sleep eight hours, you know, but they wake up and they're exhausted. Okay? Uh, so always, 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 if a person is depressed and they have chronic fatigue, you've got to inquire about sleep apnea. Now let me go back here for just a moment. Is that when they do like, the sleep studies? What's that? Is that when they do the sleep studies? You can do a sleep study, but here's the deal. Most sleep experts nowadays, what they'll do is because people with sleep apnea make this huge noise of trying to suck air through the collapsed airway, they will simply, sleep study costs a thousand bucks or something like that, send home a little uh, micro cassette or digital recorder, put it by their voice activated, put it by their bedside, and then uh, if they have apnea, it'll get recorded on that, and they bring it in the, ne the next day and say, and they'll listen to it, and the specialist will say, you got it. You know? So the diagnosis is really pretty straightforward. Uh, going back to this slide here, often no response to antidepressants. Uh, it, you know, when people are being treated uh, appropriately and aggressively for depression uh, with psychotherapy and, and also possibly with antidepressant medications, and they just don't respond, then it, it's like a little menu should drop down and you should be thinking, okay, wait a minute, there's a number of reasons that this may be happening and I need to, I need to reevaluate this. And one is to reevaluate for possible sleep apnea because when people have apnea, uh, the depression they have doesn't respond to antidepressants. But I think it needs to be evaluated the very first time. Oops, what am I doing? I'm going the wrong way here. So this is a question. Somebody's depressed and they have chronic fatigue do you snore or have you ever been told by anyone that you snore? Now, here's the deal. Uh, there are a lot of people that snore that don't have sleep apnea, okay? But people that have sleep apnea snore, but it goes beyond that. It, it's, it's something that just happens all night long. It's, it, it's, you know, you couldn't miss it. And yet people go for years. They're asleep, but the reason it's so surprising is that the person, their partner or their spouse doesn't say, hey, there's something wrong with you. And I've had couples where the guy's depressed and, uh, and I ask the question, do you snore or have you ever been told by anybody you snore? And he goes, no, I don't snore. And the wife goes, the hell you don't. I mean, why do you think I've been living, sleeping in a separate bedroom for the last 20 years? And, and I've, I have really strong feelings about this. Uh, for, for one reason, and that is I've seen uh, people who have gone for years treated for depression and it doesn't work. And it was because of uh, undiagnosed sleep apnea. And it could have been identified simply by asking this question, okay? If they snore and it's going on all night long, then they're, it doesn't make the diagnosis, but it, it, it says it's very suggestive, and then they get they go to a sleep specialist and get diagnosed and treated. I had these two guys I saw, okay, and one of them was like 45, and one of them was like 65, and this is this is some time ago. But both of these guys, same story. They had been chronically depressed, and they had had uh, daytime fatigue for years, like for 15 or 20 years, and so these guys came in to see me. And it wasn't for a second opinion, it was like for a tenth opinion. And really, true, they, they've been in psychotherapy, they've been in all these antidepressants. And, uh, and I asked them this question, 
And it turns out that's sleep apnea. And you, there's a lot of different ways to treat sleep apnea. And most people that get treated get a lot better. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, it's within a few days, okay? This is probably the most conventional treatment, CPAP, where they put this mask on your face and uh, it forces air uh, strongly enough that it gets past the obstruction. And you know, people don't like this at all. It's, you know, it's unpleasant, you know, can't get used to it. But for those people where that sometimes within days, for the first time in years, they have energy or they can think more clearly, or the depression miraculously disappears. Now that can happen sometimes within a few days. There are people who have to do it for a few weeks, and there are some people who have to do it for a few months. But when this works, it is so astounding that then people will say, I don't care if it's, uh, you know, it feels weird on my face at night, look what, what it's doing for me. Now a lot of people will bail out of this, okay? There are other treatments I'm going to mention briefly. The, the cheapest treatment that actually can work uh, is let me go back here to this, this slide, is to sew a tennis ball right in the middle of the back of a pair of pajamas. And what happens is apnea is worse when you're lying on your back. So when people roll over in their sleep, the, the tennis ball actually causes them to roll over on their side. And so they get very, uh, significantly fewer episodes of apnea during the night. And this is no kidding. I mean, it's, for a lot of people, this really works. Uh, CPAP uh, is one. Surgery is the last uh, you know, resort if nothing else works. But also now, uh, and usually these are specialists, they're typically dental surgeons who specialize in treat ap treating apnea and they make this appliance that goes in a person's mouth that repositions their jaw and, and the muscles and so forth in, in the mouth and throat and uh, prevents the airway from collapsing. Now this is not that thing you, know, you buy in the uh, drugstore, you know, prevent grinding your teeth or something. These are, they're expensive, but they're, they're uh, more user-friendly than CPAP. Okay? The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, on, on this slide, you see the airway collapses. Uh, lots of people who are depressed uh, may have, be having, tr having a lot of anxiety, they may be having trouble going to sleep. Well, it turns out that tranquilizers, sleeping pills, prescription sleeping pills, and alcohol share several things in common, and one is they're all muscle relaxants. So they actually make obstructive, uh, obstructive sleep apnea worse, and maybe sometimes dangerous. Okay? And yet lots of people who aren't diagnosed and they got depression, they got some anxiety, well here's some Xanax, you know, take this at bedtime or something like that. Not, not the way to go.